Oftentimes, we see deals being made for the purpose of negotiating in order to receive something as long as we do something for it. We see this a lot in politics, in business, in sports, when it comes to players getting a better deal, uh, car dealerships, even personally between friends and family. Perhaps uh, all those of us who are parents making deals with our children or children trying to make deals with the parents, which seems like that's more of the case. Like, for example, my son likes to make a deal with me if I tell him, all right, you need to do your homework. So dad, let's make a deal. And then he tries to negotiate something. Uh, or better yet, okay, if you want dessert, you need to eat your dinner. Now, when I was growing up, that was always a rule. And I, I recall I never missed dessert, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that, but that was a thing. That's how it was then. I mean, now there's just more and more deals being made. Left and right, hoping for something great in return. There are good deals, and then there are bad deals. Now, throughout the Bible, we read stories about deals being made, sometimes by individuals to try and get something in return. For example, Jacob making a deal with Esau, who sold his birthright for a bowl of lentil soup. Laban then made a deal with Jacob. Laban promised his younger daughter Rachel to Jacob in return for seven years of work, only to trick him to marrying his older daughter, or his elder daughter Leah, instead. So Jacob then had to serve another seven years in exchange for the right to marry his choice Rachel as well. I can read about that in Genesis 29. But of course, Jacob starting this off, and it just went throughout his life. So what goes around comes around. This is an example of starting, starting off. It's not the most desirable deal. Put yourself in a situation where Satan offered you a deal. Right away you would say, I would never take a deal from him, even if he offered you anything your heart desires in this life, like wealth and power, beauty, great skills, etc., etc. In exchange, he owns your soul for all eternity. Now, from GodQuestions.org, the idea of making a deal with the devil was made popular by the classic legend of Faust, a scholar who made a bargain with the demon named Mephistopheles. Many similar stories have been told around the same theme. In some of the legends, the person tricks the devil in some way, escaping the contract and getting his soul back. In others, the devil wins with deception or double cross. Now, you may have seen movies depicting this and had this example. Now, in any case, the idea of forfeiting one's soul in a deal with the devil is much more cultural and literary than it is biblical. The Bible never records an account of a human being bargaining with Satan or demons, but the Bible does depict the devil as a deal maker, however. It's just that he is shown attempting to make deals with God himself as opposed to mere mortals. In the book of Job, for instance, Satan proposes a kind of wager with God. If God would allow Satan to cause great suffering for Job, Satan argues, Job would surely curse God to his face. So I'd like to go to that account in Job chapter 1, verse 6. Job chapter 1, verse 6. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them, the sons of God referring to angels. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. So what he's doing here, he's seeking opportunities to cause mischief, as he's been always doing throughout, throughout time. 
and as he's doing today. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, who, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. So here, Satan is trying to make a deal with God that this is not going to happen. The Lord said to Satan, verse 12, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on this person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. And if we continue to read chapter 2 and verse 3, the Lord said to Satan, again, so obviously, you know, Job had passed that test right there. Lost a lot in the meantime, which is hard to bear. I mean, humanly speaking, it's almost very, very difficult to go through something like that where he loses property, loses his children. And yet another test and another deal that Satan wanted to propose to God. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on earth, blameless and upright man, who one who fears God and shuns evil. Still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without a cause. Satan had achieved nothing in the meantime by allowing God to ruin him. So in verse 4, I'm sorry, in verse uh, 9 we read his His wife said to him, I'm sorry, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> In verse 4, uh, So Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life, but stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. And then in verse 9, we read, His wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity, curse God, and die? So it's obviously already too much for his wife to even bear to witness this from Job. But Job's answer said, or his answer is, he said to her in verse 10, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? And all this Job did not sin with his lips. Sure, he didn't sin with his lips. I mean, you know, you start to wonder, though, what is he actually really thinking about? And we, as we know later on, Job's, Job's tests and trials that he's going through, his righteousness uh, was the big, big factor, uh, which if he wasn't going to repent from that, that would have been it for him. But see, these kinds of tests that Satan then is making, or this deal that's making with God here, is interesting. And God already has a confidence here that, you know, that Job would pass that test. But Satan also made a deal with Christ in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, where Satan tried to get him at his most vulnerable and weakest, or so he thought, weakest time, the tempter came to him, verse 3, and said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Let's make a deal here. But Christ answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. So Satan's very clever on how he is trying to make a deal here. It's his tactic, tactics as he does with everybody else and as he does in our lives. He first questions the truth, which is appealed uh, to human nature. Second, he quotes scripture, but out of context to twist the meaning. The same thing we see today. But Jesus, of course, being smarter than that, answered, verse 7, it is written, you shall not tempt or test the Lord your God. And then the third time Satan tried to make a deal or to test him. Again, the devil took him up an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said to him, 
All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. So Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan. It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Satan obviously knew that he wasn't going to accomplish his deal he was trying to make with him. Because, of course, had Satan gone along with this, then, of course, that would have been it. And you would think Satan knew better, but he still wanted to try. He still tests us what he does. So then, verse 11, he left him, and behold, the angels came ministered to him, being Christ. Now, the Bible gives no support to the notion, uh, going back to GodQuestions.org, they were saying, the Bible gives no support to the notion that people can make a deal with the devil, but some people have attempted to make such a bargain unilaterally, pledging themselves to Satan in hopes of receiving some special favors back from him. In a sense... That's the nature of idolatry and genuine witchcraft as described in the Bible. Now, there were several kings throughout history who were unfaithful to God, and instead, they worshipped pagan gods, sacrificing to them in hopes for something in return, hoping for fruitful crops, hoping for victory and battle and so on. Notice 2 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 23. There are plenty of kings I could speak about here, but I don't have the time for that, so I'm just going to point out one. In 2 Chronicles 28 and verse 23. At that time, speaking about King Ahaz, for he sacrificed to the gods of Damascus, which had defeated him, saying, because the gods of the kings of Syria helped them, I will sacrifice to them that they may help me. But they were the ruin of him and of all of Israel. But this is a good summary of what a lot of kings had put their trust in at that time, which brought about then failure eventually. If we turn to Jeremiah chapter 44, verse 3, We've been hearing a lot about the Israelites and what they had all gone through and lessons they probably did not learn or had gone through, learned, and then with all the doubt and everything that was going on, the Israelites do not go unpunished, saying in, in Jeremiah 44, verse 3, because of their wickedness, which they have committed to provoke me to anger, that is, to God, in that they went to burn incense and to serve other gods whom they did not know, they nor you nor your fathers. And so we read in verse 17 what they did. But we will certainly do whatever has gone out of our own mouth to burn incense to the queen of heaven. The pagan goddess of spring. What's coming up here? We heard about in the opening prayer about these holidays that mankind is observing, which has nothing to do with God. Here is the origin of Easter. Something that this whole world is going to be celebrating coming up. Uh, to, and then continuing to pour out drink, offerings to her as we have done. We are fathers, our kings, our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then, for then we had plenty of food, well off, and saw no trouble. The blindness that people see for a temporary, for a short time thinking that they are being blessed. Oh, there's no problem keeping this. I'm doing fine. Well, it is just short-lived. Verse 18, Since we stopped burning incense to the Queen of Heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have lacked everything and have been consumed by a sword by famine. This is what happens. woman also said, And when we burned incense to the Queen of Heaven and poured out drink offerings to her, did we make cakes for her to worship her, pour out drink offerings to her without our husband's permission? Jeremiah spoke to all the people, the men, the women, all the people who had given him that answer, saying, The incense that you burn in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem, you and your fathers, your kings and princes, and the people of the land, did not the Lord remember them, and did it not come into his mind? as if God wouldn't know what is going on. But then eventually, God's patience runs out. Verse 22, the Lord could no longer bear it. 
because of the evil of your doings and because of the abominations which you committed. Therefore, your land is a desolation, an astonishment, a curse without an inhabitant as it was, as it is this day. And because you have burned incense, because you have sinned against the Lord and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord or, or walked in his law, in his statutes, his testimonies, therefore this calamity has happened to you as was this day. So eventually, God will turn their back on them, those who do not obey him, those who do wickedness. And okay, that could happen right now, that is happening right now in this, in this world. But eventually that time will come to an end and God's patience will run out as we know about. To try and reason with Satan, which the world is doing, makes absolutely no sense anyway, since the Bible clearly reveals him to be a liar, with deception being his greatest weapon. Remember the deal he tried to make with Eve in Genesis 3 by eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, tricking her into believing that she could be like God? Of course, Eve should have known better, as God had specifically commanded her not to eat from that tree. Of course, Adam foolishly went along with it, not strong enough to stand up. Time and time again, Satan is always shown taking what is true and twisting it to corrupt and destroy human beings through his cunning and crafty trickery. But as strong as he may think he is, God is much stronger and he has the absolute power. God is always in control. And he allows Satan to carry out certain tasks, as we read about earlier with Job, as we see in the world today, the leaders that are in power right now. Is that by happenstance, or is there a plan? God is allowing these things to happen, as we have seen throughout history anyway. We are also aware of Satan's end-time fate, when his deceiving will come to an end, as we read about in Revelation 20 and verse 10. But we also know our end time promise for those who overcome and are faithful until the end, where we don't have to worry about all the things we deal with now, the struggles that we go through on a daily basis. That will no longer be the case. It will be so much better in the future. But God has also made a deal with us, expecting obedience. And if we are obedient, he has promised blessings beyond comprehension. We have no idea how many blessings that we can receive from that. So I'll finish off in Deuteronomy 28. In verse 1. It shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. Verse 2, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. A clear command. Sounds simple. Well, there's also another part to that because... It's not a one-way street, as he also says what will happen if we do not obey in verse 15. But it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. And many of these curses we are witnessing in this world when it comes to sickness, when it comes to war, when it comes to famine, when it comes to destruction and disaster. And much more of that is prophesied to happen. Christ is also adamant about this in the New Testament in John 14 and 15, how serious it is to keep God's commandments, and only by doing that will we truly love him. The most important thing we need to be concerned about is making sure we are worthy to make it into God's kingdom, remaining obedient and faithful, overcoming until the end, where we will then receive the gift of eternal life. 
Now that is a deal of a lifetime.